Europe. My name is Demelza Hayes, and my co-host Andreas Cole is here. Hi. And today we're going to be interviewing Dr. Jared Casey from the University College London. He is the author of the book Libertarian Anarchy, which has a philosophical argument for the illegitimacy of the state. And today we're going to be discussing a more controversial and, and contemporary topic, which is the culture of offense that is trending right now. So if we just wanted to go ahead and uh, allow Dr. Casey to introduce himself. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, by the way, I'm from, you got the right college, but the wrong city. <laughs> I'm oh. from Dublin, not London. But oh, hey, did I say London? <laughs> you did. That's okay. That's where, I'd like, that's where I'd like to live, actually. <laughs> Excuse me, University College Dublin. Not a problem. <laughs> And he also has a new work coming out um, that you're looking for a publisher. It's on the philosophical, what is it on? It's on the history of political philosophy from a libertarian perspective. Okay, wonderful. So yeah. if we have any publishers in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just to get started, we usually begin our episodes by asking our guests if they've done anything recently to bring more liberty to Europe? Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wish I could say tons and the whole continent is going to be converted. Unfortunately, that's not true. <laughs> okay. I've done a few things. I, I've, I've given some talk. I, I spent a few days in Prague about a year and a half ago, and I gave a talk at the Mises Institute in Belgium, of all places, about two years ago and so on. But other than that, I... Um, I can't really say I've done all of that much. My main my main contribution is uh, my my undergraduate class on anarchy law in the state, which has about forty five or fifty people every year, uh, pretty lively, and a fair amount of people, if you like, are turned on to liberty. So it's small but good. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, usually people just say, "Oh, I had a discussion with someone in the Uber cab." And I think I converted someone, you know. So no, forty to fifty kids being exposed to this type of topics, yeah. uh, these type of topics, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be doing it for the last time, starting in two weeks, because uh, I'm retiring in December. Oh. So this is my last go. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this very much. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Yeah. So just to go ahead and start off. Um, we're, so we're just going to talk about kind of what freedom of speech is, what are some of the uh, issues surrounding freedom of speech right now, and just so people can get like a background, what does freedom of speech mean? Well, it's not actually complicated. It just means that you have the ability to say whatever it is you want to say without uh, the threat or the actuality of legal punishment for saying it. That's pretty much it, really. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... From like a libertarian perspective, are there limits on freedom of speech? Uh, I would say, from a libertarian perspective, no, uh, there are not, uh, because the only guiding the guiding principle for libertarianism, of course, is the non-aggression principle, and nothing you say, however horrible it might be otherwise, uh, or unjustified or even untruthful, counts as aggression, and therefore nothing you say is going to violate the non-aggression principle. Now, I mean. Just in case somebody thinks I've gone completely mad <laughs> advocating some kind of society in which people go around saying all sorts of horrible and untruthful things. No, I'm not doing that. I'm just saying that the way to control that or to, way to deal with that is not through laws of one kind or another. Okay, so you sure. think... Uh, I'm sorry. sorry. I was going to say, you think that more like social social conventions should kind of determine what is acceptable to say and what is not acceptable as opposed to legal laws. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, look, I mean, if you think about it, um, that's pretty much what we do every day. I mean, if you're walking down the street and you see somebody who's, let's say, 200 pounds overweight, you don't normally go up and say, my God, you're fat. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. you could. I God only knows what would happen. <laughs> but, you know, we don't do that. And, and uh, in fact, society works, works effectively on the discrete comment or the little white lie. I mean, you go to parties or you talk to people and you don't generally, our culture means you don't, you don't make personal remarks about somebody's appearance. 
uh, you don't, I mean, the old rule when I was growing up was that when you met strangers, you didn't talk about politics, sex, or religion, because these were topics that were fraught and people had strong opinions, and the, the danger, if you like, of causing unintentional offense to somebody was pretty strong. So you waited until you knew somebody before you engaged, if you like, on any kind of intimate topics. And so every society develops a whole culture uh, if you like, which controls these kinds of things. And to some extent, um, I'm, I'm thinking about writing a book on this, and one of my thoughts is that law increases as cultural restraints decrease. And conversely, when we have built-in cultural restraints, you don't need laws. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we need more and more laws means, if you like, that the culture of restraint embodied in etiquette and manners and the other things, the other formal controls that we have, means that they're declining rapidly. Now I think the I think the causality runs in both directions. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I need to prove that, but that's that's my kind of starting point. <laughs> okay. No, it sounds like a good area to research. Yeah. 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 In a sense, might you say that there's uh, an economics for speech, where uh, uh, maybe one of the limiting factors uh, in speech is. Uh, uh, whether there is any demand for what you have to say. Well, yes. I mean, look, again, <clears throat> if you think about your circle of friends, um, <laughs> your friends don't have to stay with you. They're not your family. <laughs> so if you are a loudmouth, if you are constantly rude, uh, making remarks about people, you tend to lose your circle of friends. Now, in, in other words, nobody needs to take out a barring order against you. Okay, It's just that they don't turn up uh, to your parties, they, they 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 cross the street when they see you coming, and so on. So there are informal methods of controlling this, and we we all learn this, except of course those people who are radically unsocialized. I mean, uh, the bore typically is somebody who hasn't learned to read the social signals. So, for example, normally when you look at your wristwatch and say, "Oh, is that the time? I think I have to go." The other person will understand that this is a signal for s to stop talking. <laughs> okay. but the board thinks, oh, this is a signal to talk really fast and loud and to keep you there for another ten minutes. So, what does he say? Most of us learn, if you like, the, learn if you like to 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 understand the social signals and to react to them appropriately. Can't do much about boards. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, okay, talking about. The limits, okay, so there's no limits for libertarians, but what about if it's in my private property, then can I make limits? I can say, this is my private grocery store, and I don't want so-and-so to be talking about X, Y, Z. Absolutely. Is that acceptable I mean, for a libertarian society? That is not only acceptable, but that is indeed one of the ways in which control would be exercised. It's, it's basically the my house, my rules principle. So. Um, for example, if, if I have a dinner party, somebody comes along and starts talking about a topic that makes other people feel uncomfortable, at my table I would probably take them to one side discreetly and say, look, um, I, you know, we might want to change the subject. And if the person then said, well, I have the right to speak freely, I would say, absolutely. Just do it somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Not in my house. Okay? And so while you're in my house, I'm the arbiter of what, if you like, kinds of discussions and what can be said and what cannot be said. And of course, in a libertarian society, every place would be private in that sense, and somebody would be setting the rules. And a, a, license, a condition, if you like, of the license of being on somebody's property is that you agree to abide by the rules. I mean, again, this is the, there's a classic example. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the phrase uh, from, I can't remember what it was, a court case back in the 1900s where uh, the judge said, no one has a right to shout fire in a crowded theater. But nobody has a right to shout in a crowded theater. In other words, when you go into a theater, you're, you're there under license. You're, you're there, if you like, uh, you've paid to do something in particular, which is to sit quietly and watch the performance and leave when it's over. You also don't have a right to set up a hot dog stand, a right to look, by the way, and people should pay attention to this, a right to use your mobile phone, <laughs> okay, to talk to your friends, okay, a right, I don't know, to, to play chess. None of these things, in other words, so there's nothing special about that. The, if you go into a restaurant, the same thing is true. If you go to a hairdresser's, if you go into a shopping mall, they all have their rules and regulations, and the condition of being there is that you, you agree to abide by the license. If you don't, they have every right, and indeed, they probably will eject you. Okay? And the okay. same thing is true. I mean, if I want to make a speech uh, about the wonders of freedom, 
okay, which which would be a nice thing to do. And I go to my local shopping center, and I decide to declaim loudly <laughs> in the middle on the Saturday afternoon. The shopping center has every right to tell me to button it and leave, right? Even if everything I said was wonderful and marvelous and so on, it's their shopping center. They make the rules. And so in a libertarian society, we would, in addition to the uh, informal kinds of constraints that would operate, uh, that I've just been talking about, we would also have formal constraints, which are, which are expressed, if you like, in the conditions that people set down for the use of their property. Yeah. No, that's a great, that's a great point. Mm. Okay, but let me play devil's advocate. Since we're <laughs> not in a libertarian society, and yes. we have a lot of publicly owned land, wouldn't it be the government's house, the government's rules, and wouldn't it make sense to have limited freedom of speech on public property? Well, that's in effect what we do have. Right. Um, if you think about it, if you think, I mean, if you think of ownership in terms of legal ownership, people talk about public spaces, but public spaces are not your spaces. You don't have a right to any particular section, say, of a public park. There are, say, a million people in your country, in your city, and so you have a, one millionth of this park is mine. That's not the way it works. The the act, the person who actually owns that park is the person who determines what goes on in it. Whether that person is legally the owner or not is is actually irrelevant. So um, what happens is that in our so-called public areas, in our streets, in our public parks, the local authorities, the people, whoever it is, the government, the city governments are the ones who actually make the rules for that. And right now they're entitled to do it. The problem is, however, that um, there are people, people want to use these spaces for different reasons. And generally speaking, again, they have to do it under license. So for example, here in Ireland, in Dublin, if I want to organize a protest outside Leinster House, which is where our parliament meets, I have to notify the police and I have to get permission to do this. And actually, as a, believe it or not, that's, it might sound very strange, as a libertarian, I can't really argue with that because they are the people who control the use of that particular space. Right. Okay? Now, in a libertarian society, that, that wouldn't be the case. But somebody would, it might not be the local authority or the government, some, but somebody actually would own the street and I would have to get permission from them if I wanted to do something other than that which was normally done under license. Sure. So um, I just wanted to let the audience know that uh, we'll be taking um, questions at the end of the session. Um, that uh, You can start writing your questions now if you want, but we'll get back to them at the end. Um, and on that note, um, do you think that people are becoming more sensitive to um, um, hate speech? Uh, yes, I do. Um, okay, so I mean, whether or not somebody takes offense is ultimately a subjective matter. Now, some people, I can remember going to school with a young chap, and he had a particular dislike for a particular word. It wasn't it wasn't a rude word, a word or a vulgar word, but for some reason, I don't know why, maybe something to do with his personal history, he found it grating and offensive. And depending on the mood we were in, we either used it or didn't use it, depending on whether we wanted to annoy him or not. But we were aware. And so it wasn't an issue, if you like, to avoid that particular word. Um, and most of us, again, properly socialized, there are certain words which, depending on the context, we may use. Right, mm -hmm. and another context we don't use. So th these words are context sensitive, and we're gen we're aware of sort of general points of offensiveness, and uh, you know, good manners generally will dictate that you would, unless there's some overarching reason for using certain words or terms or whatever, you would avoid them, or even topics for that matter. And yeah, now I think, however, that. Again, one of the themes I'm investigating is the following. I think a lot of people have been conditioned to be sensitive or to be oversensitive in a way. I mean, you cannot go through this world with a thin skin and not be lacerated. In other words, if you are, if you are prone to take offense at practically everything, then I guarantee that you're going to be offended. Uh, I don't have the thinnest skin in the world, but... There, there's hardly a day goes by when I don't hear something on the radio, see something on television, or hear something in the speech uh, from people around me that doesn't cause me some offense. Not huge and not earth shattering, but something I would prefer not to hear, or something that irritates me. In fact, the radio is a prime instance of this. I generally, my wife thinks it's amusing, I generally end up shouting at the radio and arguing <laughs> and, and she 
says, well, you know, they can't hear you. <laughs> and I go, damn. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Uh, so we, we could all expect to be offended, right, in that sense. Um, but generally speaking, unless the, the offense is directed at us and deliberate, it seems a little bit futile to take offense. Otherwise, you're going to be offended, you know, most of your life. Yeah, that's a very good point. But do you think that maybe our society is giving people incentives to be offended? Now? Yes, I do. I, I, I think, I mean, I think the um, the development of social media, uh, Facebook, and particularly Twitter, I, which I think is an appalling uh, thing for a sort of instant group reaction. It always reminds me, you know, when you see those birds flying around and it flocks and they move around in this kind of mad way? Yeah, Twitter is sort of like that. Okay, it's like you can get instant outrage on Twitter, right? And of course, just it, it would disappear more or less just as instantly, but people react to it. Uh, and so I think uh, modern communication methods have allowed, if you like, the dissemination of speech and, and so on, and, and, uh, and people are sort of taking more and more offense in, in different ways. It's also the case, by the way, that, uh, I mean, I, gr I grew up in a generation when the telephone wasn't used. Well, we didn't have one, <laughs> okay, when I grew up. And even now, if I have anything important to say, I like to say to somebody face to face. And the reason is that in any communication, which isn't face to face, the 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 very um, uh, subtle signals that that we give to one another uh, can be misread. So very, you can write what seems like a perfectly inoffensive email to somebody, and they are going to be offended by it because they read it in a certain way. Whereas if you'd said it to them face to face, they wouldn't have been. It's the sort of bubble principle. You know the way when you're driving an automobile, you you think you're in your own little world. You know you can you can sort of pick your nose and do uh, disgusting things like this. <laughs> And, and you think nobody can see you? Okay. I mean, uh, every day as I go to work, women are in front of me sort of doing their makeup as they wait at the lights. And I'm thinking, what's the matter? You couldn't do this at home before you left, right? And uh, they think, well, I can't, just because you're in the car, I can't see you. Okay. So we were in this little bubble, and we behave differently when we're, we're not, if you like, with other people. So when we're actually face to face with people, the, which is the way we were designed to be through centuries and centuries of, of human culture and development. When we're taken out of that environment, if it's like as if it's as if we're wearing Gaiji's ring, you know Gaiji's ring, which gives you invisibility. When you're invisible, nobody can see what you do, right? So what would you do? How would you behave differently if nobody could see you? And the answer is probably a lot more loosely, and so on. Uh, is the fact that other people can see us and see what we're doing that, if you like, exerts a certain measure of control, which we internalize. Uh, as we grow up and become socialized. That's a fantastic point. I I'd like to actually tie that to um, um, one of the questions that we've already received from uh, Daniel Pryor. Um, he wants to know whether you think the libertarians should be concerned about thick free speech. So in, in essence, um, when you don't feel free to speak, uh, uh, you feel uh, people who feel like they don't have free speech because uh, they uh, they might be shouted down or subject to torrents of abuse, and he gives the, uh, a precisely the example of being online where your identity might be known, but the people commenting to what you've posted, uh, their identity might not be known, and you're exposing yourself to a lot of abuse, and a lot of people might feel this restricts their free speech. Do you, do you yeah. think you care, care about this? I, I I'm okay. Um. I don't know what your practice is, but if ever I've done anything online, I never read beyond three or four comments <laughs> because they go exponentially insane. Yeah. Right? And by the get to the tenth comment, they're having a private fight, which doesn't concern you at all, right? So don't don't deal with this. But maybe I can give an example from a recent controversy we've had here in Ireland. Uh, we recently had a referendum as to whether or not we should or shouldn't uh, legalize uh, gay marriage. Now, regardless of your position on this. Right? Those people who are opposed to legalizing it for various reasons, we have the usual people who are insane, okay? but we have people who had reasonable arguments, uh, who felt intimidated uh, because if they said anything, they were immediately greeted with, oh, you're homophobic and you, have, you're, you want to do all of these. And people say, no, no, I'm, I'm not homophobic. I just don't think this is a particularly good idea. And so... This, in fact, I'm not the only one to comment on this. Many people, indeed, many people who would be liberal in the modern sense of the term, and therefore sympathetic to that position, commented afterwards as well that there was an entire atmosphere 
of repression so that people felt, if you like, an, a, an enormous pressure not to say anything because if they did, they would incur, if you like, uh, vilification. And so that can, can indeed happen. Now, again, from a libertarian point of view, you would have to say, well, unless you're actually threatened with actual violence or somebody exercises violence against you, you haven't been aggressed against. But that doesn't take away from the fact that, yes, that, that there are other pressures. Uh, that, you know, when, when, when Mill, for example, in On Liberty, was talking about the, these, the, why, the four, four reasons why speech should be free, I mean, one of them, Mill was more concerned, if you like, with the pressures that come from society at large rather than down from the government. That's one of the interesting things about that book. And it's still relevant. Yeah, I, I think um, my analogy to that, my answer would be that uh, while libertarianism focuses on um, uh, on aggression and uh, violations of property rights, uh, that doesn't mean that libertarians shouldn't be concerned about other social uh, issues that are external to that. Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think I make the point in libertarian anarchy that the non-aggression principle is to libertarianism as a sort of water is to your diet. If you don't have water, you will die. But nobody in their right mind would suggest that the only thing that you need for a rich and varied diet is water. <laughs> okay. you, need, you need food and you do all sorts of other things as well. So clearly, uh, from a libertarian perspective, the, the, the exercise, if you like, the non-aggression principle is all you need. But we're not just libertarians. In other words, there's a whole moral dimension to our lives and so on. Now, libertarianism doesn't directly feed into that because you can, you can be libertarian and you can be conservative. You can be libertarian and be liberal. In the sense, you can be libertarian and, and, and almost anything. You can be libertarian and have a whole, adopt a whole variety of um, uh, ethical uh, positions as long as they're consistent with the non-aggression principle. I'm actually a cultural conservative. Um, but obviously I'm a libertarian as well, which is the thing that puzzles many of my friends. They go, how can you manage that? And I go, it's very easy, watch me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> which means that, so for example, if I, if I take a position that might be culturally identical with that of a conservative, the difference between us is that while a conservative is willing, at least in principle, to use the law to bring that about or to enforce it or to prohibit whatever it is that they're, they're dealing with, I'm not. And that's a huge difference. That's highly significant. Mm -hmm. So I can agree. I mean, I, I can agree with something and say, yeah, you say, I think this is a good idea. And I go, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's a good idea. Or I think this is a bad idea. And I go, yeah, yeah. And he goes, therefore, we should have a law. And I go, no. Mm -hmm. Stop right there. Right. Okay. That's where we disagree. Discussing, uh, like, laws and, and maybe, and maybe who is actually behind some of this legislation that's going to limit free speech, freedom of speech, um, Mike, Mike Hume in Trigger Warning, he discussed how traditionally it was tyrants and it was maybe politicians and people that wanted to keep control. They were the ones that were pushing for lim uh, freedom of speech legislation uh, to limit it. However, now, today, he argued that we have new opponents of freedom of speech and he, he just considered it to be average people on Twitter. Um, yes, it used to be, I mean, the government, for their own reasons, wanted to control your speech. So typically, for example, they, they control the production and sale of newspapers, uh, books had to be licensed, plays in England, for example, had to be licensed by the, uh, I can't remember, I think it was Lord Chancellor, I can't remember who it was. Um, but uh, but now, we, we seem to be only too happy to control our own speech and so on. It's the case, for example, notoriously, for example, in, in, in the university campuses in the USA, that they have highly restrictive speech codes, uh, which to me are, is quite shocking. Particularly in, in a university, I would have thought, of all places, um, one should be free to say almost anything, however horrible, even offensive. Um, to be challenged because if you're not going to if you're not going to have your mind challenged and opened in the university, <laughs> where is it going to happen in your workplace? Okay, on the street. And, the, and so I find that as an academic particularly shocking. I also find it shocking because I, I compare it with with what it was like when I was an undergraduate myself, and I have to say that my undergraduate years were some of the best years of my life. I seem to have spent an enormous amount of time uh, at parties uh, arguing with nerds like myself around the kitchen table when everybody else was dancing and listening to music. And I was, you know, there were four of us in there arguing about politics or Marx or whatever and, you know, 
and, and, and it was great and we'd go on until 5 o'clock in the morning and I'd go home and I'd be so excited I'd write a paper, 1500 words or something before going to bed at 7 and then staggering steeply into a lecture at 10. So uh, I, I would hope that that would be the experience for most uh, for, for, for your, your university student but it seems not to be. The attitude seems to be that we have a right to be protected and cocooned and nothing must happen to disturb the even tenor of our ways and I'm thinking well, you know, go to nursery school, because <laughs> that's what that is. The university is not like that. Um, uh, the, the, the mo probably the single most shocking thing that happened uh, here on this side of the Atlantic, of course, was the Charlie Hebdo affair, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, we were in Paris right when it occurred. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, now the interesting thing about that was that for the space of about maybe 48 hours, everybody in the West was an advocate of free speech. And I said to a friend of mine, watch, because very soon the conversation will become, yes, but. And the but will then, you will feel, yes, we need free speech, but. And then we can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do the other. And I was right, and maybe I got the, maybe the hours are wrong, maybe it was 72 hours, okay. But very shortly, in a shockingly short space of time, it became yes, but. Uh, I, I couldn't but smile because our own Prime Minister turned up in Paris as well. And we have uh, Section 36, I think, of the 2009 uh, Defamation Act is very strong here. It's, it's in our legislation. And it's effectively uh, a statutory encoding of the old blasphemy uh, clause which you had in our Constitution. And you're not allowed to uh, use speech or writing to that would be considered insulting by a large number of people of any religious persuasion. And I'm thinking, what? what's that doing there? Okay, um, who is it there for? Not, by the way, if you're uh, a Mooney or not if you're, what is it, the, what's Tom Cruise belong to again? What's that? The Scientology. Scientology. There's a little special clause in there which talks about, like, sects and so on. So, so you can say what you like about the sects, but not about large groupings. And I'm thinking, well, what's that doing there? In other words, I'm not trying to go out of my way to be offensive and so on. Uh, um, but if I do say something, why should I have to watch myself? Because now we have a law and people internalize it. So you start self-policing and self-regulating uh, self uh, so that you don't inadvertently, as it were, say something. And uh, once you start doing that, you've policed yourself. So it's a bit like 1984. Mm -hmm. Okay, who need police to outside you when you are actually police yourself? So I thought it was ironic that our that I was going to say I was thinking of drafting a letter to the paper to say that our prime minister might wonder whether there was some kind of contradiction between his appearance in Paris in support of the Charlie Hebdo people and the section in our in in, in our laws in our legislation which effectively bans free speech in a particular area. I thought that was kind of ironic, but in the end, I thought, well, what the hell? <laughs> right. Yeah, I like in. Trigger warning. Hume makes the joke. He says, "After Charlie Hebdo, there were so the the butts were so big they would have put Kim Kardashian <laughs> to shame." <laughs> Indeed, I, when I read, because that was after I said that, and I thought, "There's another guy who picked up on the same point <laughs> with the same kind of imagery." But <laughs> yes. yeah, it's, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good way of putting it. The butts got bigger and bigger. We had a we had a I had a discussion group at my university in France. I went to the Toulouse School of Economics, and we had a discussion on freedom of speech right after Charlie Hebdo and I was the only person in the room that was in favor of freedom of speech. Everyone else said yeah but Demelza you know these people are being offended we have the right not to be offended mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you think that is a real right that people have. No there's no right not to be offended. In fact again if you think of it in libertarian terms there's only one right and that's the right not to be aggressed against. That's it. Any other rights you have are rights consequent upon particular agreements. So I have a right to be in a, again, to take my example from earlier, I have a right to be in a movie theater if I paid for my ticket and I abide by the conditions. So if the, if the movie th uh, o theater owner were to say, you've got to leave now, and I said, well, you know, I paid for my ticket, I have a right to stay for the performance, that, that's perfectly in order. Okay, now he might say, well, because the building's on fire, and then I would say, well, okay, good idea. But, but, but I, I, did you see what I mean? So, so, so any right you have, other than the right not to be aggressed against, is consequent upon some particular agreement that you've had with one or other people. Otherwise, there are no rights. 
Sure, right. and I think there's a distinction to be made um, between positive and negative rights, um, where uh, people who advocate uh, freedom from offense uh, are actually talking about uh, positive rights. Yeah, indeed. Now, again, you see, here's where we need to distinguish, I think, clearly. One of the points I make right at the start of my uh, my class with my anarchy law and the state students is, I say, one of the tropes we need to keep in mind all the way through our discussions is the distinction between law and morality, and legal, legal obligation and moral obligation. And if you just keep those two types of obligation in, in mind all the time, a lot of difficulties disappear. So when people say they have not to be offended, what they're saying, which I think has some justification, is that in any well-ordered society, um, it would be it's right and proper for other people, if you like, to take some consideration, to take into consideration their feelings and not to deliberately go out of their way to offend them. And if that's what they mean, I don't have any objection. Who could possibly object to that? But if they have to say, if, if what they mean by that is, you are not allowed to say anything at all if I were to find it in any way offensive, whatever the circumstances or conditions. And I simply fail to see how that could possibly ar be a right or indeed where it would come from. What would be the grounding of the justification for that? And if then uh, they manage to persuade the legislators in a society to give that legal effect, then they've severely inhibited uh, your right to speak freely. Right. Sure. I think in the book that you recommended by King um, mm. on offense, Richard King's on offense, yeah. he mentioned that saying you're offended is not a good way to end an argument because it, mm. it doesn't actually substantiate your claims that you've made in your argument. It might be a good way to start an argument like to say, okay, you know, this offends me, so let's try to come to a solution. Let's try to discuss a way to get past this. But to actually end a debate by saying, okay, well, you're racist. What you just said was racist, and therefore everything you've said can now be falsified, and I yeah. won the argument. <laughs> no, no, I agree with that. Now, mind you, okay, let me just make a number of points on this. Uh, sometimes I've had conversations with people on subjects, particularly on religion, not generally speaking, by the way, at my initiation, but theirs. And sometimes the, the conversation or discussion can get a bit lively, and sometimes people's mode of expression can get a bit violent. And generally, I will say at that stage, look, um, I'm happy to continue the discussion, but not if the tone of the conversation is going to leave what I, uh, is going to go outside the bounds of what I consider acceptable. So we can, we can carry on, if you like, but we need to tone things down just a little bit. And that's generally, that's generally not a problem. The other thing, very worrying thing that, that has now happened is what I call the attention to meta discourse. So you're having a conversation with somebody and you may phrase things a little bit strongly and then they get, they, I'm offended. And now the conversation is about the offense. Instead of being about the substantive um, uh, topic, whatever it was you're dealing, we're now talking about the offense. It's now about the way you said something, and very often many substantive discussions on politics or religion or whatever it might be are derailed almost immediately mm -hmm. by somebody taking offense more or less immediately, and then we get into the spiral of discussion about what is and what isn't it, and so on. It's, and it gets exceptionally tedious. Right. That's how Andres and I argue. He'll be like, oh, honey, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And then I'll say, oh, you offended me. Let's talk about how you offended me. You know, and then we, and then I try to just take all the blame off of myself or whatever. Is that what you do? <laughs> <laughs> I just tell the other person, well, of course, if we disagree, then it's clearly the case that you're wrong and I'm right. And once we proceed on that basis, we'll get out just fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I want to um, to make this uh, sort of utilitarian argument um, and see what your response would be to it. Um, let us say that um, uh, we are going to assume that society uh, holds truth as uh, as a value. It's a pretty fair assumption to make. A lot of people uh, think that truth is a pretty uh, good. So uh, by deduction by logic, libel and defamation and other types of lies are are bad. So uh, 
you could argue that by uh, res by by restricting lies and libel and defamation, you could maximize social utility, uh, or by by at least doing something that limits those things. Uh, now, w what is going to uh, uh, be most effective at limiting uh, lies is a different question. But how would you tackle this whole liber uh, utilitarian perspective? That, no, that's that's actually a very good point. I think a number of things could be said. Um, one is that in the libel law on this side of the Atlantic, I think it may have changed recently. Um, truth actually wasn't a defense to an action in defamation. You could actually have what you said about somebody or wrote about somebody could in fact be true, but that actually wouldn't justify you or indeed wouldn't mean that you wouldn't lose your case. Uh, in fact, the, defi the definition of defamation was something like as follows. It was uh, saying or uh, uttering or printing something which would uh, tend to lower the reputation of the person you're talking about in the eyes of right-thinking people. Hmm. It's really strange. It wasn't saying something false about them necessarily, but saying something which would actually lower their reputation. Now, that's, there is now a defense of partial truth, at least, in defamation actions. Um, but here's the, here's the irony. Um, First of all, defamation law is by and large used only by people, certainly on this side of the Atlantic, who've got a lot of money. Because in order to take an action for defamation, you have to take it to the High Court, and the High Court costs around 100,000 pounds or 100,000 euros per day. Right? Oh so if you're, if you're an ordinary Joe Soap, you're, you're very unlikely to take a defamation action. So in that sense, it, it doesn't cover a lot of people. But there's a, there's a more fundamental point, which is this. Right now, if something is printed in a newspaper or reported on television, because we have libel laws, because we have defamation laws, there is a presumption that what's being said is true. Because otherwise you would say, well, they wouldn't say it because they'd open themselves to an action. Now, in a libertarian society where you didn't have defamation laws, there would be no such presumption. In other words, so anything could, if anything could be said by anybody, then you have no particular reason to believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. Right, and therefore, it, it it in other words, the the damage, quote unquote, that's caused to you by somebody saying that's untrue about you is much less likely to happen in a libertarian society than it is in the situation we have now. So, for two reasons, then, having defamation laws, not a good idea. One, because most of the population are not protected by them in any case, and two, they give rise to a presumption of truth in the allegations, which. Uh, wouldn't be there if we had actually got uh, a libertarian situation where there was no defamation law. Okay, yeah. so uh, I guess that ties in with uh, one of the questions from our guests uh, who asked whether um, someone has a right to um, sue a newspaper if uh, they're spreading lies in, or in order to damage that person's reputation. Uh, I wonder the newspaper would be liable for this. Well, Okay, now, we, we all, <laughs> this, this thing comes up in different uh, contexts. We, we don't live in a libertarian society right now. Okay, that's not a good thing or a bad thing, but it's just a fact. So, in the situation right now, if somebody wanted to sue using the existing defamation laws, I wouldn't actually have a problem in principle if they wanted to do that, Be precisely because we have a situation that's not of our making or, their, or not of their creation, in which there's a presumption of truth uh, on the part of those who print or say things, if you like, in public media, and therefore you have a right to defend yourself in the only way that's possible. It's like the, it's the example give. I can't remember who gave, came up with it. It's um, in another context. If you're sitting quietly in a bar having a drink, at, you know, before you go home at the end of the day, and all you want to do is kind of sit there and meditate, okay? And a fight breaks out in the bar, and and suddenly, you know, you know, like in the Western, you know, chairs flying all over the place and so on. And you didn't start this. You didn't want any fight. But if somebody starts coming towards you with, with a chair ready to hit you on the head, you're going to actually, actually have to defend yourself. You can't say, I'm sorry, we shouldn't have had this fight. There shouldn't be a fight taking place. And I shouldn't be in the middle of it. Like it or not, you are finding yourself in the middle of a fight, not of your making, and therefore it seems to me perfectly legitimate to use whatever instruments there are, whatever tools there are to defend yourself in that context. A similar argument is made, for example, in relation to, to whether or not people should vote uh, in, in elections. 
And, you know, depending on the mood I mean, I sometimes go over and spoil my vote, or I sometimes go over and vote negatively. That is to say, given that somebody's going to be elected, whatever I do, okay, and I have no choice about that, I want to minimize the damage. I want the least damaging person to be elected. Not that I support that person, but I support the others even less. So somebody in that situation is, is again, if you like, finding themselves in a situation not of their making and using, if you like, the instruments to hand to defend themselves. In a libertarian society, of course, it would be different. First of all, you wouldn't have laws, right? And therefore, it wouldn't be possible to sue. But there would be less reason to do so. Okay. All right. And indeed, we're not in a libertarian society, and it's hard to, to um, really predict what would happen in a libertarian society. We can sort of suggest that... Uh, there probably would be some sort of uh, polycentral, uh, polycentric uh, legal system, but we we definitely cannot um, predict what the uh, uh, specifics of that would be uh, in every single society and region in the world. But do you think that um, in a libertarian society um, things would tend to go in a way where um, full, um, how to phrase this? Full, full uh, statements of damage, uh, including those that aren't uh, respective to to property rights violations, uh, would be considered. So, what I mean by this is, uh, uh, if someone broke into my property to find find out things about me, and uh, then spread uh, those truths about me. Uh, which I didn't like and which uh, hurt my business, for example. Uh, obviously, I can sue them for uh, for breaking into my property, but would I only be compensated for their breaking into my property, or would I be also compensated for the bigger damage done to uh, my business uh, uh, on the long term because of this? I'm a little bit conflicted on that one. Um, I... I'm tempted to think that information acquired under a violation of the non-aggression principle should, if you like, be somehow um, s secured to you in some particular way. I, 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 I'm going to stop right there because what I'm, going to, what I'm going to say is going to get me into trouble on this one. I actually haven't thought through that one in particular. I do. It is a really very. It's a very good question, right? Um, and it depends. It really depends on what principle you sort of start with. There's a principle in the common law that a criminal should not benefit by his crime. So, for example, if you commit a murder, right, and you're convicted, and then you write a book about the commission of the murder, and it becomes a bestseller, okay, and you make a lot of money, okay, the common law has frowned on that because they, they would argue that you really shouldn't benefit by your crime. And so if you took that approach, to the situation that you could escape me, uh, it would seem that a similar thing, a similar principle could be applied. In other words, that the what the information legitimately acquired uh, is, is is um, dispersable in any way you choose, but information that was acquired through a violation of the non-aggression principle should not be. I'm, I'm inclined to think that. I'm inclined to go that way, but I haven't really thought it through, and, and there may well be objections to it that I haven't considered. On that note, um, I, th I see an area where libertarians disagree, and it's the right to be forgotten on the oh. internet. So, how do you? What's your stance on that? Well, assuming that there, okay, <laughs> I haven't thought about this one before. I would think that assuming that there aren't other problems with the information that is on the internet about you, right? That it hasn't been, say, illegally acquired or something. I I don't see where a right to be forgotten would come from. Right. How would that be grounded? Well, the, words, if, yeah. if having it up there at any stage wasn't problematic, why would a time element enter in and make it problematic? I can see why it might be desirable. I can certainly see why things that now embarrass you, <laughs> okay, it would be nice if people would forget about them and not harp on them all the time. But I don't see how you can actually re uh, you can require this as a right. I mean, most of us have done things or said things that we would prefer not to have done and not to have said, and we would like it for there not to be a record of them, but I don't see that there's much you can do about that. Yeah. No, way. I agree completely. When Andreas and I met each other at the Gottfried von Hobler conference in Vaduz uh, last year, and 
there was a speech by the CE, the founder of the Internet Frontier Found Electronic Frontier Foundation, and basically him and a lot of other guests in the audience, which this was an Austrian economics conference, a lot of guests in the audience supported the right to be forgotten. And Andreas and I were just like, <laughs> where is this coming from? This is totally coming from left field because I just, I don't see, the, I mean, it's, it's, it is a threat to freedom of speech. People yes. might not look at it that way, but it is. It's basically limiting what I can have access to. Yep. Um, so. You know what? I think this somehow ties in with intellectual property rights. Uh, John Perry Barlow, the man who was uh, speaking at that conference that also was talking about, uh, was a uh, lyricist for The Grateful Dead, and um, uh, he's probably in favor of intellectual property rights, uh, and the way he might justify the right to be forgotten is that uh, he has a, a copyright on uh, things he has written, and thus uh, can um, uh, limit uh, uh, its reproduction. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Well... Okay, but okay, all right. In the current legal situation where copyright exists, then you do have a right to uh, determine the reproduction of the material that you've written. Yeah. Right? But I, for example, <laughs> even even within the current copyright laws, for example, there is their fair use. So somebody is entitled for scholarly purposes to quote some material that you have without requiring, without requiring explicit permission from you to do so. Um, that already exists, so somebody could say, well, whoever, I can't remember the guy you just mentioned, but Joe Soap uh, wrote a song uh, five years ago uh, in which the, he said in the opening two lines and then you would quote them and so on and so forth, and that's perfectly permissible, even now. Nobody can stop you doing that now. You don't require any permission. Right now. Yeah. Um. Do we have any questions from the audience? We're... Um. Yes, we still do have one unanswered question from Daniel. <laughs> he uh, says, so I'll read the question. You mentioned meta -disc uh, discourse earlier and how conversations get derailed because people talk about the language used and the fence. Is there a use for these sorts of conversations? Language doesn't seem to be neutral and perhaps worth changing. Then again, shouldn't language is in should changes in languages follow from changes in belief rather than, than the other way around? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a very good point. I, I, one of the themes I'm hoping to develop in this book, if I ever come to write it, is the relationship between language and reality. And there are people, I think, who believe in the, the magic of language, that all we have to do is to change the language in relation to something, and that changes the very nature of what you're dealing with. Okay, so if you call a, a rubbish collector a sanitary engineer, somehow you've changed the nature of what it is that they do. And of course you haven't. They're still doing the same job. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and so you see this process of, of attempted amelioration, uh, tried and failing. I can give an example from Ireland. Uh, and again, I have to be careful about this because even talking about this now is the kind of thing that will probably give offense to somebody. Oh but there are groups, there, there's a group of people in our society who were, when I was growing up, were called tinkers. These are people who travel around in caravans and so on. That term came to be seen as being appropriate, right? And it was changed more or less by government fiat to the term itinerant. And for the space of about 10 years, everybody had to call them itinerants. That became appropriate, <laughs> okay? And now they're called travelers, right? So uh, this process, ha now, the people haven't changed, and I'm not making any judgment on anybody. But I'm just talking about the language here, and just saying that we've had that we've had these people called three different things, and my guess is that who knows, in 10, 15, 20 years' time, it may well be that the term traveler becomes offensive, and then we have some other term as well. So when the underlying reality or situation doesn't change, and the relation between people in different sections of the community hasn't fundamentally changed, changing the language magically does not change the nature of reality. People believe in a certain kind of magic, it's like casting a spell, right? But when the reality, when the, when real things change, when people come and grow together and so on, then they're happy with the language uh, that they use, and people settle down, okay? Um, but it's certainly true that, I mean, I've lived long enough to, uh, to go through several culture shifts and terms that are or are not. And one of the things I tend to do when I arrive somewhere is to try and figure out 
what things I can and can't say since the last time I was there, just in case uh, things have changed and you could inadvertently cause offence. And right. I don't want to. If I want to offend anybody, I want to do it deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so, okay. I'm sure that this is probably obvious to a lot of people, but why is it important that we protect freedom of speech? Well, I think the, the classic source for this, and the still best source, is uh, J.S. Mill, where he said, and I'm just trying to find it here, first of all, he thinks, if the, if the opinion you're expressing uh, is repressed, it may actually be true, and therefore something as valuable as not being allowed out into the community. Even if it's not entirely true, a portion or an element of it may be true, and therefore the society is made poor by this. But I think those are those are two important points. But I think his third and fourth point are actually even more significant, which is that um, if you do hold an opinion uh, and it is true and somebody challenges it, if they're not allowed to challenge it, your holding of that view or opinion or truth, if you like, becomes a dogma. Right? You, you know, in order for a society, if you like, to to hold truths in a living and vital way. It is very, it is vitally important that they are challengeable. Okay, so even if the person putting it forward doesn't have a particularly good argument and so on, it's still important that they that they do that. Um, and that I think is is really probably the most important point. Okay. Now those are consequential arguments. In the end, as a libertarian, I would say we don't need any uh, a, any consequentialist justification. In other words, people should simply be free to say whatever they want to anyway. But I think the consequential argument that Mill gives is a very useful supplement. To, uh, to to the basic libertarian point. But you think that the freedom that freedom of speech is founded in propertarian theory, or it's founded in natural law? Well, I just think if you if again if you start from the libertarian basic principle of non-aggression, right? Then, since nothing you can say is possibly uh, aggressive in that sense, unless it actually is part of an action where you're you're doing it, then then you, it doesn't need any special justification any more than your right to walk down the street or to tie your shoelaces or to do anything else. It's just, it's just, not, uh, it's just not aggressive and therefore there is, there is and should be no law to prohibit it or to limit it in any way. Other than the kinds of things we've talked about already, if you like, the rights accruing to property owners to, to set the rules on their property. Now, do you think there's, there's something to be said about um, the fact that, um, or, or just the question of what, of how effective those laws would uh, are anyway. Um, now, uh, supposing that a certain kind of speech is objectively bad, uh, how good is uh, legislation at actually t uh, stopping that kind of speech? It will probably stop it in formal contexts, but what I think tends to happen is when you when you criminalize or delegalize uh, something which people want to do anyway, it tends to go underground, or people develop alternative ways of doing whatever it is that they want to do. They just become clever at doing it. I mean, we see this obviously in, clearly in cases, for example, in relation to drugs or drink or whatever it might be. In other words, when you when you feel when you block up the legitimate channels, all that happens is the activity goes underground, and to a certain extent, becomes more uncontrolled. Now, I have friends who are working at who are doing writing who are writing dissertations in the area of, of internet communications, and uh, and uh, what they tell me uh, is incredibly shocking to me. I'm not easily shockable, but I mean, my my approach to this is is the same approach I have to people who are offended by what they see on the television, which is the television has got a switch, turn it off, right? Mm -hmm. Don't don't engage in activities on the internet which are going to take you into these waters. I mean that's as crazy as it is to walk into a strange town and 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 find yourself in an area where the grass is growing up through the cracks in the pavement and the buildings are derelict and to walk around with your wallet sticking out of your back pocket. Okay, in a well-organized society, you should be able to do that. But hey, it's really stupid. <laughs> okay, it's not a good idea, right? Stay away from those kinds of things. Right, just just don't go there. Right. right. So when we were in France, um, like a lot of people, they thought that a good way to end prejudice towards Muslims was by outlawing, uh, you know, say, um, making fun of. Allah or making fun of the Quran and I thought that it would just lead to more 
bigotry and people like do you do you donate the comedian um, yep. the, the great crazy. name yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean it seems like he's becoming more popular because France is trying to repress yeah. the French government is really trying to repress these feelings um, that people are having so I don't know what do you think that that's like outlawing uh, you know certain words or certain speech is going to actually be an effective way to achieve no. Indian race. I mean, first of all, I, I just think it's wrong, but I also think from a consequentialist way, it's actually counterproductive. People simply go underground and, and they find other ways of doing it. Look, I'm a Christian and I'm a believer, right? So when people make fun of various things, I don't particularly find that hilarious or funny, but hey, it's a great big world. I'm a big boy. I can live with it. I'm not going to collapse in a heap and fall down, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what do I say? You know, I mean, my beliefs are no more sacrosanct uh, than anybody else's. Okay, so whatever you believe, or if you're an atheist and I make fun of your atheism, what, are you going to get all hurt and offended and cry? I mean, what's, what's going on here, right? We're, my point is, you know, we're big boys and girls. We're adults. Grow up, right? Mm -hmm. Learn to live in the world, right? You're not little kiddies anymore. You don't need to be wrapped up in cotton wool by your mom or your dad or whatever. Grow up. Learn to live in this world. Learn to rough it a little bit. Okay, so somebody offends you. Big deal. Ooh, ooh. Sorry, I'm I'm radically unsympathetic on this one. <laughs> uh, so I have no sympathy, right? It's just it's just and so I mean, in fact, I I as I said, I'm giving this my class on anarchy law in the state for the last time, and I have a list of things in there on my initial announcement, which say things like, you know, unless you're prepared to participate in the discussions, you know, consider deregistering from this class and so on. I go through various things, but one of them says, you know, we're going to have uh, frank discussions on controversial topics in this class, if you're in any way uncomfortable, this would be a good time to deregister. Otherwise, that's it. That's the only warning you're going to get. It's like a meta trigger warning. Okay? okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not, that's all I'm going to say. That's it. People are free to say whatever they want to say, however shocking and horrible it might be. I will control the class I mean, if it gets out of hand. I mean, I will, because it's my class. Right. My house, it's my sure. class. But other than that, I want, I want people to be free to say whatever they want to say, however shock, shocking and horrible it might be to other people. And if they want, you know, if, if what one, one of my friends called in the context of very fainting couch feminism, I think, is, is uh, what's her name, Patai's name for it, which is, oh my God, it's like a return to 19th century Victorian women who are so delicate and so on that, that, that some strong words or something like would cause them to faint, okay, and, you know, uh, collapse in a, in a horror. And I'm thinking, no, we're not going to have fainting couch kind of feminism or fainting count masculism and so on, so grow up, learn to live, this is university, you're an adult, okay, you can take it, you'll survive, you won't die, not from this anyway. We're <laughs> almost out of time, but um, do you, can you spend the last couple of minutes uh, uh, giving us your perspective on the future of Europe? Uh, do you, uh, does any country right now seem to show that it's closer than others to remediate this situation? Where do, do some are some countries going worse? Where do you think it's going? I can't really give you a considered judgment on that largely because I don't really know enough about most of the other countries. I don't know enough about the intimate details of what goes on in France or Germany or Switzerland and so on. Um, I'm, however, particularly disappointed uh, in the countries with common law traditions that would be in the United Kingdom and Ireland, for example, that we seem to have capitulated in various ways to certain aspects of the I'm offended, I'm hurt, let's not offend anybody, let's restrict free speech. I suspect, I could be wrong about this, but I suspect that in every country in Europe, um, some more than others, uh, the situation is bad and probably not likely to get better in the near future. I suspect it will probably get worse rather than better. Uh, I find that even in my class, when I, you know, when I make the points that I'm making, and they fi they find it very hard to argue against, when when you put it, nonetheless, a lot of them are not persuaded. They're not convinced by it. They have a sort of lingering attachment to the idea that they need to be protected, or if not them, other people need to be protected, and so on. And 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 so, you know, when you consider that most people are not exposed to the strong arguments for for the freedom of speech and the and the merits of it in its own right, not to mention its consequential merits, a la mill. Uh, and when you consider that in most European countries, mo most European countries, as France, as you know, highly statist, okay, um, but 
But even in Ireland, for example, one instinctive reaction to almost any problem is for somebody to say, well, the government should do something about it or we right. should have a law. And that kind of reaction indicates, if you like, a cultural uh, approach to uh, how we deal with things, which is not, does not bode well for, for the future of free speech anywhere in Europe. Right. I, I I'm, remember... I'm sorry to be so depressing. <laughs> oh, no. It's, it's good to be realistic. I remember in Hume's book, he... He mentioned that um, Voltaire's secretary or student, Evelyn Beatrice Hall, said, I, I do not agree with what you have to say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. Say and it. what Hume says is that now what we have is reverse Voltaire's, where everyone's saying, I disagree with what you're saying, and I'm going to fight to the death to make sure you can't <laughs> say it at you all. Don't say it. Yeah. yeah. And, That's uh, absolutely right. It's just, it looks bleak. But if to end on a positive note, what would be like one way we could go in the right direction? Like, would we would be repealing certain legislation, or what? What would be the best direction from here? Well, okay. I mean, this sounds very modest, uh, but in the world in which we live, it may be all that we can get. I would I would um, counsel the either the repeal, if or if not the repeal, the uh, limitation. Or the uh, the emendation of defamation legislation. So, for example, I would make truth an absolute defense. So that if if some if I say something about somebody and they take an action against me, and if I can prove it to be true, that would be the end of the matter. Now, that's that doesn't sound earth shattering, but I think that's a small step in the right direction. Right. Not for sure. And uh, you know, I, I mean, again, if I were if I were a university student now, uh, which I'm not. It's, uh, I would, yeah, I would be working, you know, to try and persuade uh, universities to to get rid of speech codes and all of that. So wherever you are, I'm sure there's probably something that you can do, uh, in a small way. But I'd, I'm not expecting any revolutions soon because if you like, the tide is shh, coming against us, and uh, it's kind of overwhelming. Right. <laughs> sorry again. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I've depressed everybody, but hey, what can I say? I think another great movement too is this whole crypto anarchist movement which is basically where you can't be linked to your identity anymore if you use PGP encryption or um, other methods of hiding what you're posting online so there are certain ways to keep your freedom of speech I mean it is going to be it might become illegal these methods but you will be able to use certain mm -hmm. methods to kind of hide um, the content that you're producing if it becomes illegal to actually talk about these topics in the future. That's very, I did not know about that. You, you've told me something I didn't know. Yeah, there there's certain, <laughs> there's certain ways now where um, you can't be tracked, so that's very nice. And um, okay. also, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Casey, for coming on our show. Thank you so much. This was a it's been a pleasure for me. Fantastic speech, uh, discussion, and next week, I just wanted to tell our viewers that we're going to be interviewing Juan Pina, the president of the Spanish Libertarian Party, PLIB. So I hope that all of you will come check that out. Thank you. <laughs> See you next week. Okay.